All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second UW Astrobiology Colloquium of Spring Quarter. I'm Mike Wong. I'm a postdoc in the Astronomy Department and the Astrobiology Program. Uh, one of the things that I love the most about the UW Astrobiology Program is that it really embraces the interdisciplinarity of astrobiological inquiry. You know, it takes folks from all kinds of diverse backgrounds coming together to try to answer some of the biggest questions in the universe. And not only that, but our program serves a wide swath of the campus community from faculty in eight different departments to our graduate students who are earning dual titled people. PhDs to offering undergrads and postbacs their very first research opportunities. And so today we have a real treat. We're going to hear from four different UW astrobiology scientists who are pushing the envelope of discovery in vastly different areas, but all united by the common goal of trying to understand our place in the universe. So uh, the way things are going to work is that we're going to do all four presentations back to back. Uh, they'll last about 10 minutes each. Um, and we're going to save all of the questions for the very end to make sure that we're still on time. However, you're very much encouraged to type your questions into the chat. Um, and if you're very lucky, maybe one of our speakers will even answer your questions before we get to the live Q&A part. And finally, um, to make sure that our speakers have all of the bandwidth uh, for their presentations, Let's keep our videos off and our mics muted for the duration of the presentations, okay? So let's begin uh, by uh, introducing our first speaker, Adriana Gomez Buckley. Adriana is a postback research scientist and a teaching associate in the UW Department of Astronomy. She earned her bachelor's degree in astronomy uh, from UW in 2020. And as an undergrad, she was a core member of the UW League of Astronomers, a student-run astronomy club that seeks to expose as many people as possible to the joys of astronomy. And Adriana has been working with myself and Dr. Max Showalter on an exciting project about the astrovirology of icy satellites. And I'm really excited for her to share this research with all of us today. So take it away, Adriana. All right. Uh, hello, all. Um, can you all see my screen OK, my slides? OK, perfect. So as Mike said, I'm Adriana. Um, I work with him and Max. Um, and our work was generously funded by Vicki's grant. So thank you to her. Um, and today, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about um, our research on the viral elevator and how we've modeled virus and bacteria populations in Europa's icy ocean. So to start with, I want to give a little bit of an overview about um, marine environments and how viruses act in them. So on Earth, um, we can see that our organic carbon is going to be primarily entering the ocean through this photosynth photosynthetic CO2 fixation at the ocean surface. And then it's going to travel through the food chain and eventually it's going to get trapped at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and this whole process is called the biological pump. So viruses are very important because they actually prevent the total sequestration of all this carbon at the ocean bottom. Um, and they do this by cycling organic carbon back into the system by creating dissolved organic matter um, or dissolved organic carbon. So it's also referred to as DOM or DOC. And this whole process is known as the viral shunt. So in icy ocean environments like the Arctic, we actually see that this will become even more pronounced. So in Arctic sea ice, many microbes will become trapped within the ice in these briny pockets that are pretty small. They're on the one millimeter to one centimeter scale. And because they're within the ice, there's no sunlight reaching them. And they're also too small or too saline for a lot of larger organisms to live in. So the life within is these tiny microbes and it only has a really fixed pool of DOM um, to consume. So when viruses lice and infect this bacteria, they actually create more DOM, so the pool kind of becomes somewhat replenished over time. And from Dr. Showalter's dissertation work on this, we know that viruses are key players in this recycling of organic carbon in the sea ice. And he was able to actually model these bacteria and virus population dynamics um, through a set of differential equations. So that brings us to our initial model and our initial set of differential equations. Um, so N here is nutrient, D is DOM, and then B and V are representing bacteria and viruses. And I've labeled each term here to make it a little bit more clear whether they represent an increase or decrease. So you can see that we have some that are increases from growth, some that are decreases from things like death. 
And this is for a closed system that has a fixed DOM pool. So later on, we actually applied it to an open system environment, which is something more like an open ocean. And we added terms for things like bacterial predation and an influx of DOM. And we wanted to apply this to more of an open system because we thought that it could be an analog for bacteria and virus population dynamics in a similar environment in our solar system. And that is Europa. So this icy ocean in Europa has a global layer of thick ice that has an ocean of liquid salt water underneath. And a widespread theory is that life would have to fix its carbon chemosynthetically from hydrothermal vents at the ocean bottom, because again, ice is preventing this photosynthesis from happening at the top. And we also know that the ice convex, so there could be brine pockets in it similar to Earth. I'm gonna go highlight those two things. And the two main questions that we had with our research were, can these pockets transport life to the surface through convection? And could life survive in the open ocean underneath the ice? So that actually brings us to the concept of our talk, which is the viral elevator. Um, basically, this is a reverse of the process that's happening on Earth. So again, um, in this drawing on the left side for A, that shows a simplified version of our own oceans. And then B is roughly how we imagine this could work in reverse on Europa. So we can kind of think about it like an inverted ocean where the life is fixing its carbon near the hydrothermal systems at the bottom. And then DOM is created through the viral shunt and it can be carried up to the sub-ice ocean layer and support life there instead. So our first concern was, can Europa's ocean support this DOM transfer within a reasonable time scale? So first we looked into a current model of Europa's ocean, which is on the left. Um, and the study found that there are large scale currents in three zonal jets. And also there's these two equatorial circulation cells. And it found that these are capable of transporting heat and materials between the ocean floor and the surface. And again, on the right, I have a diagram that kind of shows this inverted ocean concept and showing how life could exist under the ice in these kind of biofilms or like a shallow biosphere. So our other concern was that there could be a freshwater layer between the ice and the saline ocean. And we were worried that this might disrupt the flow pattern because um, this freshwater layer kind of acts like a stratified lid and it can prevent currents from moving through it. So if so, the DOM would have to rely on diffusion to get through this layer. And we did confirm based on these given possible depths from the study um, done on the freshwater layer that DOM could still diffuse through it in a reasonable time scale. So after we took care of these concerns, we moved on to our initial closed system tests using the model. So we varied burst sizes, which is how many viruses are generated per an infected bacterium. And we did this to test the microbial population's longevity. So pictured here, we have these plotted over time. We have the bacteria in green, viruses in black, and it's over 2,000 hours on the left um, to get a better closer look, and then 100,000 hours on the right to show where each of them is going to die off. And um, of note here is that there is a very large time between these population peaks. So they were about 500 hours or 21 days apart. And we also plotted the VBR virus bacteria ratio over time. So these gray dashed lines are the average VBR value with the y-axis on the right. And then our results here show that there was very high VBRs that were on the order of about 100 to 1,000. And this is pretty similar to Earth's VBR, which is usually around 10 in aquatic environments, but it has been found to span several orders of magnitude in sea ice and Arctic environments. And so pictured here, I have again, different birth sizes over 300, 10,000, 100,000 hours. So we have these same plots from before, but now we have an additional one showing the total amount of DOM over time. And we can see here that for our max parameter for birth size, our system didn't actually persist past um, even 11.5 years. So given current estimates for Europa's ice convection, which is on the order of one to 100 kiloyears, this means that the microbial life in a brine pocket wouldn't persist long enough to reach the surface alive. So what's really important about this is that it tells us that while surface landers could theoretically observe dead organisms or remnants of organic material, ideally, if we want to look at active populations, we would have to look in the open ocean, probably. And also of note here that what we found interesting was that viruses seem to act as population control. So when we have a small burst size, um, the bacteria seems to kind of go through this runaway growth and it depletes the available DOM very quickly. Um, but when the burst size is larger, that means that there's more viruses that are keeping the bacteria under control, so to speak. And so DOM is kind of consumed at a slower, more gradual rate. 
Um, because there's some uncertainty as to how life works on Europa and what the parameters of the system are, we kind of took a uh, Monte Carlo approach and decided to test randomly picking some. So we uh, put in ranges for birth size, infection rate, uh, and then starting bacterial virus uh, populations and the starting amount of nutrient. Um, and we used ranges that were physically motivated by Arctic studies and literature. So you can see here that most of our runs were still dying out before this 11.5 year mark, um, and they didn't persist um, past about 20 or so years. So we did some initial open system tests too. Um, so we found a steady state for the system and you can see this in the graphs flattening out. And the look on the bottom is just a closer look at the sinusoidal shape of the steady state. So for our steady state, we found that um, the bacteria was around 65 per milliliter. The viruses were about 28 per milliliter. And this gave us a DBR of about 167, which is within that range that we found before. And um, to support the system, we found that the influx of DOM from the viral elevator would have to be about 1E minus 3 micrograms per milliliter per hour. So we took this and we went to our next step, which was to constrain depth and biomass. Um, so we have a color map here showing a sub-ice uh, biosphere depth in millimeters and uh, benthic biomass synthesis rate in kilograms per day. And the black line in the middle is our found value of 1E minus 3 micrograms per milliliter per hour. So values that fall to the left in the blue are the ones that would support our steady state system. So bringing back this figure from a few slides ago, which shows life in the form of biofilms under the ice or shallow biosphere, our results suggest that this would be no more than 100 millimeters in thickness. And this is kind of a global equivalent layer. So it's kind of an average. Um, and this is purely based on influx of DOM from the viral elevator. So there could very well be other sources of organic carbon. So to discuss our results a little bit, um, we found a long time between peaks, and this implies that we need to search for life over a long time period in order to account for this because we don't want to get a false negative between these population peaks. We also found a high VBR, um, which implies that viruses have a significant presence in these systems. And this is in agreement with findings from studies done in the Arctic on Earth again. So we should consider including them in the search for life alongside more conventional organisms like bacteria. Um, there are plenty of limitations to our model, of course. Um, it's pretty simple at this point. It doesn't take into account factors like temperature dependence, and it starts with um, these fixed bacterial and viral populations for our open system still. Um, and we also can't really model things like phage host specificity on Europa. Um, this is referring to the preference of some viruses to infect certain types of bacteria. Um, we can't really know this without looking on Europa, unfortunately, and it's also not that well known on Earth and icy ocean systems either. Um, so for our future work, um, we are currently working on a more complex model that has these random population starting seeds, as you saw um, some of our preliminary work on. And um, hopefully, we'll also have temperature dependence for some of our parameters. And then eventually, we would like to run our random picks like we did for a closed system, but for our open system instead. Um, so to close out. Um, icy ocean environments on Earth can act as an analog for icy ocean moons. Um, we found that our viral elevator is a plausible method of DOM transportation on Europa. And we have also found that viruses play a key role in icy ocean environments, and we should probably consider including them in our search for life on Europa. So a big thank you again to our funders who made this work possible, and thank you to all of you for listening. Fantastic job, Adriana, um, clapping on behalf of everybody out there. If you have questions for Adriana, just throw them in the chat. Again, we are taking uh, the live questions at the very end after all of our speakers have concluded. So it is my uh, pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, grad student Greta Shum. Greta earned her bachelor's degree in comparative literature from Princeton University. Before coming to grad school at UW, she worked as a research fellow at the University of Bern, a multimedia journalist at Climate Central Incorporated, and a digital communications specialist at Princeton. Greta is passionate about strengthening diversity in STEM and communicating climate change to the public. To these ends, she hosted The Shum Show on YouTube, which is really quite good and you should all check it out. Uh, now a third year grad student in atmospheric sciences at UW, she is not only concerned with the climate of our own world, but also the implications of climate science for life elsewhere. Take it away, Greta. 
Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, it's really exciting to be talking to all of you, and I hope that um, you know we can all stretch our imaginations in thinking about the implications of this work on astrobiology. Um, generally, I'm going to be telling you a story about the relationship between land surface properties um, on Earth uh, and their interaction with the atmosphere. And I think in our attempt to detect life on other planets, these kinds of interactions have become more and more important. So this uh, talk is about modeling self-perpetuated climate and forest expansion, and I'm using the mid-Holocene as sort of a case study for how this kind of interaction could take place. So I first want to start us off by oops, thinking about how when the state of the atmosphere changes, plants on the surface are affected and they react in their growth, and you know this from probably working in your garden, um, plants grow better during some times of the year and worse in other times of the year, and we all know this. But it's also true that the behavior of plants on the ground actually affects the state of the atmosphere as well. And these feedbacks are really important. In fact, they constitute a pretty strong um, uh, part of the uncertainty that we have in projecting future climate change, how plants will respond to any given forcing. Um, and what that means as a feedback is actually um, a really wicked problem in projecting um, changes in our future climate. So how do these interactions happen? Um, mostly uh, the changes in our surface that affect our atmosphere go through the surface energy budget, um, which looks like this. We have shortwave radiation incoming at the surface, um, and that can be released in the form of longwave radiation, uh, sensible heat flux, and latent heat flux, and also can be stored as storage. But generally, um, plants on the ground can affect any of these um, quantities from how much solar radiation is actually absorbed by the surface by changing the albedo. Plants can uh, alter the aerodynamic conductance of the surface by altering the roughness of the surface um, and therefore change how much heat can be released uh, through this pathway. They can also alter how much heat is released in the form of latent heat. Um, and that happens because when you have a plant on the ground as opposed to having no plants on the ground, your pores open up and you're able to transpire in addition to having evaporation. This is particularly important for land surfaces, right? Not necessarily in the ocean where you can evaporate as much as you want. Um, and then of course, plants are able to exchange gases like CO2 and H2O, which regulate how much um, heat, the energy, heat is stored in the atmosphere and also the surface temperature. So all of these terms get modified by whether you have plants on the ground and what kind of plants you have on the ground. And it's also been shown that these feedbacks are just really strong across all land surfaces. So this is a result from this paper um, in 2019 that compared uh, temperature change that resulted from a change in albedo in a land-only experiment to temperature change that resulted from an albedo change in a coupled experiment. And this is the change in that um, that it's the percent change in the change in temperature. And you can see that if it's red, that means that temperature got warmer from that warming um, that already happened. Except for in this little blue part, overall we see this magnification effect. And it's particularly important in the high latitudes. So vegetation atmosphere feedbacks in the high latitudes have the potential to generate large changes um, in regional growing conditions for themselves. So that means that if you change something on the ground and that changes something in the atmosphere and that has a feedback that will initiate changes in the growing conditions and have these like very accelerated feedbacks um, and this happens in the high latitudes because the albedo effect is changed and also our water vapor feedback is changed so this paper in 2010 showed that if you plant vegetation or you replace bare ground with forest in the high latitudes you can see that uh, you can make a warm, uh, warming through these two pathways. You can have a darker surface, which causes ice to melt. Um, sorry, you can have a darker surface, which causes warming, which can cause ice to melt. You can have more productive biosphere because plants like living in a warmer place. And you can also do the same thing by having more water vapor, which causes more warming, which causes both of these feedbacks to happen. So it's just a really strong um, place for this to happen. So we've been kind of talking about studies that placed um, a forest on the surface of the earth and looked at the implications of that. But you can kind of think of past climates as ways in which plants were imposed onto the surface and then altered um, the atmosphere around it. And that happened uh, specifically during the mid Holocene when um, our orbital conditions were different such that we had higher solar radiation during the summertime um, in the Northern hemisphere, which changed tundra, which is what we know as like barren, um, you know, ice covered, uh, very um, 
non-vegetated areas into taiga, which is a forest or a boreal forest biome. Um, so you can see that happen in this little, little time series from 10,000 years ago to modern. You can see that there's this emergence of really um, thick uh, boreal needle leaf evergreen trees. And this particular time series is showing you the uh, density of forest coverage of this picea or spruce species. But overall, there was just an expansion of this boreal forest. And it's been shown that that expansion of the forest alone, or the just generally higher density of forest cover, actually contributed to warming in the same sort of order of magnitude as the orbital forcing itself that initiated the forest at the beginning. And you can see that there's actually a seasonal twist to this, and the trees do most of their warming during the springtime and summer when they're um, more visible and there's uh, uh, actual um, changes that they can have a part in, whereas orbital forcing um, contributed to warming at other times in the year comparatively. So what we'd like to ask in uh, sort of the study that we've been doing is, can land atmosphere interactions of this ilk influence the climate enough to drive forest expansion alone? So in order to kind of probe this, we set up, um, we, we want to think about it in a certain way. So we're looking at the changes in the atmosphere that occur because we imposed a forest um, and how that would influence nearby forests just adjacent to that because of a circulation change or because of warming um, that's local that gets expanded um, and, and see if a forest might itself perpetuate its own expansion just through its interactions with the atmosphere. So uh, what we've done is uh, modeled this kind of scenario where we looked at a particular place where, that had forest during the mid-Holocene but doesn't have forest right now um, and imposed a 100% um, boreal forest block over this area or in Alaska with room for it to expand to the west and a little bit to the south and um, in order to kind of keep with this analogy of the mid-Holocene we placed a block of ice where forest could not grow just adjacent to that um, uh, block of forest and in our control experiment we placed bare ground on the ground uh, so that their interaction with the atmosphere would be lost um, and also had this ice sheet adjacent to it. So you can think of the influence of the forest on the atmosphere as the difference between these two atmospheric states once run to equilibrium. So we can take a look first off at the influence that the forest had on the atmosphere. So I'm showing you the change in these different terms in the surface energy budget just over this region where we imposed a forest. And you can see that during the springtime, we have an increase in the shortwave radiation received, and that's because we decreased our albedo, which allowed us to absorb a lot more shortwave radiation. And then in the summertime, we see actually a decrease in shortwave radiation received. And that ends up being because plants on the ground, when they photosynthesize um, and transpire, produce a lot more water vapor available to the atmosphere and a lot more clouds. Um, so you actually reflect a lot of the shortwave radiation that would have been um, received by the surface in the bare ground experiment. Another thing that happens is that uh, warming actually uh, takes place as, uh, alongside this increase in energy received. So um, in the springtime, uh, our warming and therefore increase in outgoing long wave radiation sort of follows the same signal that you can see um, the cooling that comes along with the decrease in shortwave radiation during the summertime. Now, of course, we impose this giant forest over the uh, area that I'm talking about. And so this uh, increase in latent heat uh, released from the surface can be seen over the course of the growing season. And finally, for the final term, this increase in sensible heat flux sort of follows the pattern of the temperature in the springtime and then a uh, decrease in sensible heat flux outgoing from the surface to the atmosphere when we plant the forest. Um, again, follows the, follows the pattern of the outgoing long wave radiation. So the general trends that uh, you can kind of discern from this plot here is that in the springtime, we see a lot of warming near the surface as an impact of the decrease in albedo. And in the summertime, we see a cooling as a result of the impact of the cloud creation. So that's what happened over the forest, but what we're really interested in is what these changes in the atmospheric state mean for nearby plants and whether they can grow better just because of those changes of their neighbors. So if we uh, take the atmospheric state and we apply it to two, um, uh, sorry, if we take these two different atmospheric states and we apply them to the same land uh, and cover all the land with maybe um, potential plants that could potentially grow in this region that, that mean something for the succession of forest um, in the boreal region, we can see what actually uh, the difference in atmospheric state meant for growing. 
And we did this for lots of different types of plants that actually matter for boreal forest succession. And we saw that overall plants grew better adjacent to this forest, except for in the place where we imposed this ice sheet, which of course meant that it was really cold near the surface and the plants didn't like growing there. So this is just one of these many different kinds of plants that enjoyed growing there better. I have actually analyzed these different regions um, separately, but I'm just going to focus on what actually happened in the south really quickly and tell you what happened um, to the atmosphere and why it meant increases in growth there. So you can see that there's this increase in growth across the entire growing season, but especially in June, July, and August in this south region that I'm boxing here, there's significant growth, which is indicated by these stars for all these different types of plants. So how does the forest change that nearby climate? Well, overall, we had a cooling over, this, over the region where we planted a forest, if you remember, but it actually caused a warming response outside of the region where those plants were. So for ourselves, we, plant, we uh, create this cooling, but for our neighbors, we produced a warming which helps growth um, uh, for most plants in the boreal region. And this happened because we actually reduced clouds. You had the opposite response uh, outside of the region where we planted a forest. And the reason that this happens is that most of the time in this region, we have an influx of heat and moisture from the Gulf um, that allows us to warm these plants and allow them to get the warmth that they need to grow. Um, and when we impose a forest, we actually produce this circulation change that causes cooling and then subsidence, and as a result, uh, a circulation change that's anticyclonic here, as you see, that produces an increase in meridional heat transport from the south to the north, just over this region. Um, and of course, this is a change in velocity, so it's gonna transport both heat and moisture, but we can tease apart the implications of what increasing the amount of heat transport and increasing the amount of moisture transport would mean for atmospheric variables in this region specifically cloudiness, um, by uh, looking at the influence in relative humidity that each would have individually. So if you change your moisture amount and if you change your um, uh, saturation vapor pressure separately, you can see what the influence of relative humidity would have been in either case. So on the one hand, we have a change in moisture as a result of an increase in velocity from the, from the Gulf uh, that would produce a a higher relative humidity over this region to the south. And on the other hand, we had a change in temperature that actually produced a decrease in relative humidity. And as a result, in the net, we produce for most of the atmospheric column a decrease in relative humidity and a decrease in cloudiness. And that means an increase in growth for all of these plants in the, um, in the region adjacent to the forest. So just as a summary, we saw that summertime cooling, specifically in this region that had forest imposed due to an orbital change, produced cloud formation and drove a circulation change uh, that produced more sunny, uh, sunny days to the south of the forest. Um, that's all I have, and thanks for listening. Thanks, Greta. Uh, yeah, everybody uh, clap, throw up those clapping emojis. Uh, very nice. Uh, if you have questions for Greta, please put them in the chat. And we'll move right along to our next, next speaker, uh, Thea Weiss. Thea double majored in neuroscience and English literature at the University of Southern California and is now a fifth year graduate student in the UW Department of Psychology. In her research, Thea seeks to understand the human condition as revealed by the precarious position humanity finds itself in as a result of our technological affordances and conveniences, conveniences that may become essentials as we wade deeper beyond the cosmic shoreline. Thea is also a member of the UW boxing team. And uh, take it away, Thea, it's all yours. All right, awesome, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share. Cool, and then I just wanna make sure this thing works to advance slides. Let's see, yes it does. Um, all right, so yeah, thank you Mike for the introduction. So again, my name's Thea, uh, coming to you from the Human, Inter Human Interaction with Nature and Technological Systems, Hints Lab. Uh, from the Department of Psychology. Today, I'll be presenting to you uh, on the work I'll be doing for my dissertation titled Becoming a Tree in Virtual Reality, Investigating the Efficacy of an Embodied Virtual Nature Experience to Alter Psychological and uh, Physiological States. So let me move this box of our faces. Cool. 
So within the solar system, Mars exists as the closest reasonable planet to search for evidence of life beyond Earth. Um, and as Perseverance has most recently shown, um, the so-called uh, robot geologists, these rovers, could do much to further our understanding of the possibility of life existing on other planets. And building upon these uh, rover missions, NASA and other international space agencies still wish to further our knowledge of other planets' ability to host past or present evidence of life through human exploration. So, um, among many uh, operational and uh, logistical obstacles that need to be overcome in order to enable uh, human space exploration, um, there need to be, uh, needs to be consideration to psychological countermeasures. Uh, so we know from research on Earth that uh, isolated, confined, extreme environments present unique challenges for human performance. And these can be categorized um, under disturbed sleep, interpersonal uh, tension or conflict, impaired cognitive ability, such as issues with memory, vigilance, attention, and reasoning, as well as uh, negative affect, that is depressed mood, anger, ir and irritability, and anxiety. And above and beyond what we see in these ice environments on Earth, um, we know that long duration space exploration uh, is just going to present an even greater likelihood in the pre prevalence and the severity of uh, mental health issues. So in order for humans to search for life elsewhere in the universe, in addition to uh, attending to the, the biological consequences of long duration space exploration, like microgravity and space radiation, um, the way to ensure mission success is going to also be uh, putting the appropriate attention toward uh, psychological countermeasures. So here on Earth, we know that nature contact is associated with reduced stress, uh, reduced anxiety, and uh, reduction in chronic health issues. So within the nature and human health field, there's two large theoretical frameworks that uh, describe the mechanisms behind why people benefit from interacting with nature. The first is attention restoration theory, and that is uh, that interaction with nature allows for the recovery of our uh, fatigue directed attention. The other theoretical framing is a uh, stress reduction theory. And that is that uh, interaction with nature allows for the engagement of our uh, parents, parasympathetic arm of our autonomic nervous system, um, thereby allowing for us to be restored from stress. Um, it's important to note that uh, it, we're not only seeing improvements in uh, people's cognition um, and their emotional level through self-report, we also see changes on the neurophysiological level. Um, so work by uh, my, a committee member of mine, Greg Bratman, in the School of Environment and Forestry Sciences uh, back in 2015 showed that um, when he had participants go on a nature walk, a 90 minute nature walk versus a 90 minute urban walk, uh, he saw reductions not only in self-reported rumination, rumination being a, a maladaptive attentional focus on uh, events of one's own past life, uh, wherein uh, you made a mistake and you just uh, perpetually think of the causes and consequences of that action. So he saw the nature walk uh, people having a uh, reduction both in self-reported rumination, uh, but also in the region of the brain associated with rumination, that is uh, the subgenual prefrontal cortex that you see here. So we know nature is uh, it's good for people, it helps reduce stress um, and restore attention. So how do we get it to people on these long duration space exploration missions? Um, so virtual reality has been used as an intervention tool in clinical settings uh, to help treat phobias and also to help distract burn patients when they're uh, getting their wound dressings changed. Um, and the effectiveness of virtual reality interventions is likely a result of perceived technological presence, um, which is the, the degree to which one feels psychologically there. In the, in the technological or in the simulated environment. So Whitmer and Singer were early contributors to the field of presence and telepresence. And they, uh, they theorized that there were four factors that feed into uh, that psychological state of presence and that being uh, control factors, sensory factors, distraction factors, and realism factors. Here I'm focusing on sensory factors and in particular, this idea of multimodal presentation. Uh, so that just refers to um, the number of sensory modalities that are presented simultaneously in the virtual environment. Um, and it's, we've seen that uh, multimodal experience in VR, uh, experience engages more than one sense, uh, but particularly more than just vision and audition um, is more effective and more engaging. So in this, 
uh, experiment I'm showing here, uh, researchers found that when participants uh, not only uh, viewed the donut, the virtual donut in VR, but also uh, had the olfactory, the smell experience of the donut, it led to increased satiation uh, in real in the real world following the experimental uh, intervention. So the people who had both the, the sight of the donut plus the smell uh, ate fewer actual donuts in real life than those who did not. Uh, so it led to real world satiation. So virtual reality can also be used to create uh, perspective shifts and even induce empathy. So virtual embodiment of white participants as a uh, black avatar uh, in VR has led to a decrease in implicit bias. Um, and embodiment as coral reef um, experiencing uh, advanced uh, accelerated timeline um, and seeing the result of ocean acidification and also of uh, boats disrupting the, the coral reef environment. Um, in this study, they had uh, the, a, a boat in the, so you're the coral reef, a boat comes up to you and then they have uh, simulated haptic input um, of, I guess they had, they had an experimenter prod the person, but that was their haptic input of the coral reef being disrupted uh, by the boat. But those who had that increased sensory input uh, felt a greater inclusion of nature in the self and concern for the environment and a desire to act. So in addition to the my desire to look at VR as an intervention tool to help uh, support uh, human mental well-being on long duration space exploration, um, I have another goal of this work, and that is of uh, increased planetary stewardship. Um, so as part of the most recent astrobiological uh, strategic document, uh, it's noted that it's a, it's a decadal goal to promote planetary stewardship through understanding the re relationship between life and the environment. And I think what that means for uh, us as a species right now is to, to be very aware that nature is being destroyed globally at rates that are just unprecedented in human history. And the most recent UN Global Assessment Report indicates that human-caused landscape transformation is a major contributing factor for the extinction of one million plant animal species. Um, and so for humans to search for life elsewhere in the universe, I think it's important for us to uh, understand our roles and responsibilities as stewards of planet Earth and to help to do our best to ensure the health and well-being of all life on this planet. And so my guiding research questions in my work um, are there's two, uh, one in the human health countermeasures category, the other in uh, promoting planetary stewardship. So first, to what extent can an embodied immersive virtual nature experience induce emotion and alter human physiological state? Uh, number two, how can simulated embodiment as a tree in virtual reality generate individual perspective shifts and promote greater planetary stewardship? So I'm working with um, the creators of Tree VR. Um, the, you see them there, Winslow Porter and Melissa Zek. And this was a computer generated uh, virtual reality experience premiered initially at Sundance uh, a couple of years ago. And in it, you become a, uh, you experience the life, the whole entire life cycle of a K-pop tree in the Amazonian rainforest. So I'm gonna let you see what it looks like. So this is the whole tree VR experience. It begins by a uh, subject planting an actual physical K-pop tree seed in a pot of soil. Um, and that's the tree that you're going to become in this experience. So then you don the VR gear, you're standing. Um, so you have the typical head mountain mounted display. Um, you have headphones and then you have a, a haptic vest that you wear. And then you have the controllers in your hands. So as you put on the gear, the first thing that you're gonna see is that you uh, are a seedling that's emerging through the soil. At the same time, um, we have uh, olfactory input. It's uh, just the con soil concentrate, just the, the scent. And then we uh, feed compressed air through it. So there is your soil scent as you grow up through, um, through the soil. Okay, now you're a tree and you uh, experience the development of the tree from uh, like a you know, a thin like sapling to you being the biggest, the tallest tree in the forest. As that happens, we're also, uh, we change the scent uh, pod to a tree rainforest smell. Um, and your, your arms now work as branches. You can interact with the environment around you. Um, if you hold it really still, like a bird can land on it and it'll be different each time you experience it. Um, as this is happening, um, this is where the majority of the experience occurs. Up to this point, it's probably been about like five, seven minutes. 
Um, and then the sun sets, the moon comes out, uh, mist rolls in, and uh, we use a fan uh, to emulate that experience. But this is when a shift occurs uh, in the experience and uh, the subject will begin to smell smoke. Um, they'll also uh, feel rumbling, all the animals around them, the birds are leaving and they see off in the distance fire um, and it draws closer. Um, you're, every, every, every other animal that can move is getting out of there, but you're stuck there. Um, you experience a fight or flight response, but you can't flee. And as the experience wraps up, um, you go from the first person to the third person perspective, seeing the entire forest and the tree that you were um, ablaze. And then uh, you're prompted to reflect on uh, the words of an indigenous leader from the area. Um, and they say, we must protect the forest for our children, grandchildren, and uh, children yet to be born. We must protect the forest for those who can't speak for themselves, such as the birds, animals, fish, and trees. And so my experimental procedure is uh, it's going to be a between subjects experimental design. And that means that uh, each participant uh, only experiences one of the three conditions. The three conditions being uh, condition one, full sensory VR, exactly as I just explained it to you, the important uh, uh, additional sensory input being the haptic vest and the olfactory input. And again, the, the tactile input of the, the, we have a heat fan or a heat, whatever, yeah, fan uh, for the fire part and then uh, a regular fan for the, when the mist is rolling in. So then condition two is uh, what I'm terming half sensory VR. You're still standing. You still get the virtual reality experience of the, the head mountain display and uh, the controllers and the audio, uh, but you are not getting the haptic vest or the fan or the heater um, or uh, the smell. And then the third condition is just a, a passive video. So watching the experience, but it is a recorded version of the experience that someone had in VR. Um, and that is what you're watching on the video. And at the beginning, everyone will have experience the same stressor. Um, so that will be a uh, rumination induction task whereby you ask the participant to uh, reflect on an event that they where they caused a mistake um, that happened recently, you have them write about it, and then you have them read it out to you. So that's a rumination induction to stress the participants out. So in terms of <clears throat> measures and uh, predicted outcomes, for the human health countermeasures, um, to, I want to assess alteration of psychological state. So that is the rumination induction task um, and to assess the degree to which uh, affect might change. That is uh, positive affect and negative affect. I want to assess alteration of physiological state. So I'll be recording, continuously recording heart rate and galvanic skin response, which is just a degree, the degree to which uh, your hands are sweating. Um, uh, also presence and technological presence using the Whitmer and Singer presence questionnaire, as well as a, uh, a presence inventory that's in development in my own lab. Um, and then for planetary stewardship, looking at uh, perspective shifts for the environment. Um, so after each session, there will be a 30 to 45 minute semi-structured interview to investigate shifts in anthropocentric and biocentric reasoning, as well as using the connectedness with nature scale and inclusion of nature in the self scale. Um, and yeah, I think I'm about wrapped up. I went a little over time, but I just want to let you know that um, in the experience, in terms of it being a, a effective uh, physiological and psychological state uh, induction, we expect the initial part to be uh, restorative, but we also expect this the burn the burn event to be strong in eliciting a physiological and uh, emotional response from people. And in this way, it can be a proof of concept that uh, virtual reality nature experience can be an effective uh, indu induction technique for psychological and physiological states. And it would be the first reported investigation of a VR nature experience incorporating uh, these four sensory modalities. So thank you so much. Thank you, Thea. That was absolutely fascinating. All right. Um, so our final speaker today is Eric Agel. Eric majored in physics and mathematics at UC Berkeley, go Bears, and earned his PhD in physics from UC Santa Barbara. Uh, Eric then held postdoc fellowships at Johns Hopkins and Caltech before becoming a professor in UW's astronomy department, where he and his students have pioneered theoretical modeling of exoplanetary systems and many other astrophysical phenomena. Eric is also the faculty advisor for the Pre-Major in Astronomy program, or PreMap, where uh, which supports undergraduate 
undergrads from traditionally underrepresented groups in STEM who are interested in astronomy. Eric, the floor is yours. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the system that's my background right here, the TRAPPIST-1 uh, planetary system, which was found because the star is so small, the planets um, are about the size of the Earth. They appear larger as they uh, pass in front of the star, cast a deep shadow that was detected with ground-based telescopes and reported in 2016. Uh, three planets were reported. In 2017, we did an uh, experiment with the Spitzer Space Telescope to stare at the star for 20 days and found a total of seven planets. Um, and so <clears throat> this was exciting because the planets are similar in size to the Earth. Um, they're also at a distance from their star where the incident flux isn't too different from the incident flux received by the Earth, uh, Venus and Mars, they kind of span that range in the habitable zone. Um, so let's see, I'll share my slides right now. And, and um, so just take a second. <clears throat> and give a late hour, I'll, I'll probably do, um, uh, just share a few of these slides. So with the discovery of these seven planets orbiting the small star via the transit technique, we then would like to measure the properties of these planets because they are some of the most promising candidates for detecting the atmospheres of the planets via transit transmission spectroscopy looking for molecules uh, absorbing light as the light from the star passes through the planetary atmospheres. And the reason they're so promising is because of the small size of the star. The sun, which is the, the orb uh, that's just going into my uh, screen background, is, uh, is about uh, eight times larger than the Trappist-1 star. So the planets um, block a much larger fraction of the Trappist-1 star versus if they were orbiting the sun. And so this uh, gives a much larger signal and therefore better signal to noise, which makes it more promising for looking at the atmospheres. Um, but before we study the atmospheres, we'd like to know uh, the radio of these planets. We can get that from the transit depth. We'd also like to know the masses. This is trickier to do because the star is fairly faint. And so it's difficult to measure the Doppler shift of the star uh, due to the planets orbiting it. But it turns out there's another approach we can use, which is the dynamical interactions between the planets. And so unfortunately this takes a large data set. So we underwent a campaign with the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is uh, shown in the upper left here. We observed 188 individual transits of the seven planets in front of the star. The specs of the star are given in the uh, box towards the middle of the top. Um, we also gathered data from the Kepler spacecraft for its second version K2, 126 transits and then uh, did some other follow-up with ground-based telescopes, namely the Spectrales, Trappist North and South telescopes, and then several other telescopes for a total of 447 individual transits which were observed. With these data, then we can look at the dynamical interactions between the planets as they pass uh, one another in their orbits. They tug on each other and that slightly changes the orbital periods. And so we can see the periods drift in time. And then by fitting an eight body gravitational model or M body model to these planets, we can try to measure and for their masses, as well as their uh, radii from which we get the densities. The bulk density then constrains the individual compositions of the interiors of these planets. Um, so here's our data set. Uh, so the upper left panel shows the transit times of the two inner planets, which are labeled as B and C, A being the star, so B and C are these first two. The spacings of these aren't to scale in this diagram. Um, so the upper left uh, shows what are referred to as transit timing variations. And so this is, you take each time of transit, um, this is actually time on this axis here in days, you fit a line to these transits, and if the planets were exactly periodic, the transit timing variations would be zero. The residuals to that linear fit are what are plotted here, and the residuals have units of minutes. So this is, you know, uh, variations in the orbits. Um, these two planets have orbital periods of 1.5 and 2.4 days, and so there's a um, small fraction of the orbital period that's varying, primarily due to the interaction between these two planets, B and C, are the most massive of the Trappist-1 planets, and I'll show the masses in this slide or so. Um, and so they, uh, and they're fairly close to space, so they have strong dynamical interactions. Um, the lower left is the next planet out, planet D. And these are all labeled in these insect uh, captions. Uh, the upper right are planets E and F, their transit time variations. And then the lower right is planets G and H. G and H have periods of 12 
in uh, 18 days, roughly. Now, if you focus on the lower right, you can see there's two signals we see. There's a large sinusoidal variation. This is uh, referred to as sometimes the, the super period or the resonant period. It has to do with the fact that 12 uh, to 18 period ratio is close to three to two. And when you're close to a J to J plus one integer ratio, you get a very strong coherent dynamical interaction, which is close to a resonance. You also see a smaller uh, kind of back and forth uh, variation that looks like a sawtooth. This we, we refer to as chopping. This is actually a, um, really useful for measuring the masses of the planets because the larger amplitude variations you see are have a degeneracy between the eccentricities and the masses of the planets, while that small zigzagging uh, variation is just dependent on the masses of the companion planet. And so from this analysis of this entire set of 447 transits, some of these have air bars so small you can't even see them on this diagram. They're the colored uh, dots are the actual data, while the colored lines are the model. We get a very good fit to the data, and then we do a Markov chain Monte Carlo analysis to infer the uncertainties on the masses of the planets relative to the star. We combine with this an analysis of the depths of transit, and we also measure the density of the star. And then we also have to um, use external data to gauge the mass of the star. It's about 9% of the mass of our sun or 90 times greater than, us, than the mass of Jupiter. From all these data then, we can measure the radii of the planets versus their masses on a scale, which uh, basically is, is fairly independent of any stellar model, which is nice because stellar models uh, are poor for um, small stars like Campus One. The cloud of uh, colored points you see are the posterior probability distributions. Um, everything is given relative to Earth, which is here in the center at 1, 1. The dash curve is a rough uh, estimate of the mass radius relation for an Earth-like planet, so how it varies in radius as you would vary its mass. You can see that Venus uh, lies very close to that line, as does Mars down in the lower left. Um, and the one thing, uh, the other thing is that the, the curves for each of the planets labeled uh, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, um, have one and two sigma confidence contours, and the um, colored uh, brightness is proportional to the probability distribution. The individual colors which are used um, give the rough temperature scale. And so uh, green for the Earth is most similar, I guess, to planet E here, which is a little um, bit bluer than the Earth. Um, what you see is, we, first of all, we have very precise measurements of both the radii and the masses of these planets, um, better than the precision for any other terrestrial planet exterior to the solar system. And so with these data, we can do a careful comparison with our terrestrial planets. And the, the most immediate thing that you see is that these do not lie in this dash curve. These planets are different than our solar system. They all lie a bit above in radius, which means that they have a slightly lower density um, that's smaller by about 9% relative to uh, an Earth or Venus like composition. Um, and so we've uh, gone to some effort to try to model the properties of these planets. Um, we, one way to model these would be to have a fully um, oxidized iron uh, planet, so no core and add all the oxidized oxygen to lower density material, so that would cause a slight lower density. Um, alternatively, you could still have a core, but a smaller um, fraction of iron. We don't know the composition of the star, so we actually don't know the expectation for the ratio of iron to silicon and magnesium for the star system. Um, and so there's still some degeneracies, but the most robust conclusion we can make is that they seem to come from a comp common composition, as indicated by this magenta curve plotted here. And uh, that composition is different than our solar system. It seems to be slightly lower density. With these data, we can also forecast the times of transit in the future and secondary eclipse when the planets pass behind the star uh, to be observed with the James Webb Space Telescope. There was just approved um, 20 transits of all seven planets um, to be observed during the first cycle of James Webb, which is due to launch in October. And then also 14 secondary eclipses have been approved to be observed for the inner two planets, B and C. All this work, of course, took a huge collaboration to gather all the data and do the analyses. And so here uh, are the pictures of my collaborators, which were, uh, span three different continents, and telescopes span three continents in space. Um, and then these are their institutions. Um, and you'll notice that we have a, a big uh, University of Washington presence, which are the pictures with a purple border to them. So I'll end there. Thanks. 
Wonderful. Thank you very much, Eric. Extraordinary. Um, okay, so uh, we are now going to transition into our question and answer session. Um, and I see that there have been many amazing questions in the chat. Most of them have already been answered very thoroughly by our speakers. So thank you for doing that. Um, what I think I'll do, because we're a little short on time, is if your question has not yet been answered in the chat and you'd like to speak it out loud, or if you have a brand new question that you didn't type yet into the chat, please raise your hand and I'll call on you uh, to unmute your mic and turn on your video and ask the question. Uh, this is Don. I have a question for Eric. Go for it. So, uh, Eric, uh, what is the uh, uncertainty in the density measurement? I mean, how well do you know the diameter of the star? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so the star, we actually get a very precise density measurement from the durations of the transits. Um, it turns out that the, um, if you know the orbital period of the planet, then the duration of the transit is it provides a good constraint on the density of the star because lower density stars will have a longer transit duration. They have a lot larger size. And so um, by measuring the durations of all, all the transits, um, you can see that they increase with the orbital periods of the planets as you would expect due to Kepler's law it increases period to the one third. And so this actually, all seven planets give us a very precise um, density constraint, which is um, about, uh, I don't remember the exact value, but something like few percent uh, precision um, wow. about it's Great. 50 times the star is very dense it's about 50 times the density of their sun because it's so compact um, and so you can see with these uncertainties the nice thing is that because we have a good density of the star we measure the mass ratios from the transit timing and the radius ratios from the transit depth and so some of the uncertainties parallel an isodensity contour and so actually we get a, a better constraint in the composition because of that uh, the shape of these uncertainties, which is kind of neat. Yeah, it just seems quite different than the solar system where we have Mercury's on one end and Mars on the other. It's a variation of the oxygen content, you know, the oxidized iron, or maybe even sulfide. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sulfide. arguing that that's the, 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 the oxidized uh, interior is the, is the correct yeah. model on the thing. It's one end member that uh, nicely explains the data without any fudging any factors. You just take yeah, the that's great. like compositions and, and oxidize all the iron, which is yeah. kind of cool. Um, Eric, Nick has a quick question about how you choose priors for mass and radius for your MCMC. Do they matter? We have a uniform prior in those. So um, we don't, uh, the, fortunately the data are very constraining. So the prior shouldn't be too influential, which is nice. Great. Adriana, Charles Laird asks, uh, looking for viruses is a fascinating idea. Uh, perhaps I missed your idea on measuring viruses. What strategies do you propose? Um, well, there's a couple of things we could do. So first of all, um, our only planned missions to Europa so far are um, flybys, including the upcoming Europa Clipper mission, which is very exciting. Um, we know that there is potentially some like plume activity on Europa. Um, so a flyby mission like the Europa Clipper, um, I think is going to have instrumentation that can potentially collect um, material from these plumes and then possibly analyze it. Um, but then as far as actual landers goes, um, there's only some potential ones. Um, there's something like uh, EELS, uh, which is an actual EEL-like eel robot that's being proposed by JPL. And that could actually um, explore the surface and actually drill down into the ice and actually swim in the ocean underneath. So something like that would have an instrumentation like um, liquid or grain collectors that could actually oh. take samples and um, observe possible microbial populations. Um, so that's a couple of ways that we could measure these. And thank you for your question. Awesome. Uh, could I just follow that up? I, I didn't understand. Uh... How, are you going to do microscopy to check viruses or chemistry? What, what are your, what's your plan for identifying them once you find them um, or to find them? Yes, no, that's a good question. Um, so I'm not as well versed in like microbiology, um, but I know that some ways, yeah. So microscopy is one, like you mentioned. The other way that I know that they've done um, studies on actual um, 
by microbial populations and actually uh, measured things like metabolic rate, I think is through like fluorescent or radiometric um, tags of certain kinds of, I think, um, enzymes in them. So something like that, I think would be a good way to measure them. That, that's great if, if, if you have the host in which the virus can grow. Mm -hmm. But, it, but it's, I think that, I, I don't know what you could do besides microscopy, but it's an interesting pond, thing to ponder. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I'm not as well versed in like the actual instrumentation that goes into these crafts, but yeah, it is mm -hmm. something that definitely should be thought about, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, Greta, I wanted uh, you to have a chance to uh, talk about this very interesting question from Maxime that you already answered in the chat, but just for everybody, uh, what would be the influence of changing the dominant color of the vegetation on biosphere atmosphere feedbacks? You know, especially if you think about biospheres emerging on other worlds around other stars, maybe their photopigments have a different uh, spectral absorption distribution. What do you think the effect of that might be? Yeah, I, this is a super cool question that um, I think can be explored in this this model that I mentioned in their response, the SLIM, the Simple Land Interface Model. And it's sort of been probed at with that one study that I linked to where they changed the color of broadleaf evergreen trees to be dark, the color of evergreen trees, and then they changed the color of evergreen trees to be the color of broadleaf trees, but kept their functionality the same. And I remember like a colloquium talk a while back, maybe last year, um, by, I can't remember his last name, but Andrew, and he was saying, he was talking about uh, a regime where you would have solids forming in cold domains that had a lower albedo and then liquid, uh, the equivalent of wa a water cycle, but with the opposite albedo. Um, and I think you could, have a similar experiment with that kind of physical change in processes and as well as a change in physical and in um, biophysical properties uh, using that land model. Um, I think right now the people who developed the model are trying to get it to work with ExoCam, which is NCAR's exoplanet atmosphere. But it'd be really cool to uh, play around with it and just apply different forcings uh, regardless. So. Yeah, there hasn't, before SLIM, there wasn't really a way to modify albedo without changing the constituents of the surface uh, properties. So now that SLIM exists, that would be a really cool experiment. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, I think that was Andrew Rushby, um, a postdoc. At yeah, Andrew UC Rushby, Irvine. that's right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and Thea, I want to give you a chance to um, discuss this question from Kim Bott uh, about the uh, uh, effect of nature-focused meditation and how that compare and contrasts with the effects that you uh, have been experimenting with. Yeah, yeah, I really like that question because um, I, I mentioned at the very end uh, that we, in addition to looking at the Whitmer and Singer presence questionnaire, um, and that which is uh, looking at the psychological state of uh, being there in the virtual environment, which is how presence in the VR literature has been talked about for the last 20 years. Um, we're generating a scale in my own lab uh, to look at presence as a construct um, more related to mindfulness um, and one that we think uh, it can be especially generated from uh, experiences in nature, but not only there, also in other uh, maybe med meditative experiences. And so still in development, um, but at the moment we have the potential factors being uh, present moment awareness, stillness of mind, non-reactive mind, and then uh, the more like uh, radical one of uh, merging or expansion of consciousness. So we're seeking to see if uh, the more immersive VR condition, I guess, yeah, my hypothesis is that the more immersive virtual reality condition would both increase technological presence, but also potentially um, presence in this, uh, in this mindful way of understanding the term. Awesome. Okay, well, since we are over time, I think uh, we should uh, wrap up and thank all of our speakers once again for sharing their amazing science with us. Uh, well done, everybody. That was